Hey everybody, welcome back to a, another episode of Just the Tip with Dr. Vic. My name is Dr. Victoria Hartman and I am the Executive Director of the Erotic Heritage Museum uh, here in Las Vegas. So, um, well, things have been moving right along. We're just about done. I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on at the museum. We're just about done with the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, we just got one more character to be installed and then we're good to go. So we're 90% there. We're really excited about being done with that exhibit. So um, we're going to take on a saucy topic today. Uh, so <clears throat> the um, talk of course, in the news, uh, one of the major topics is the um, the uh, six week uh, abortion ban bill that um, was signed by the governor and went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court uh, opted to, uh, at this juncture, not provide injunctive relief to the um, plaintiffs in the case that were seeking injunctive relief against that. A uh, ban going into effect. So I thought we'd have a conversation today about, um, I'm not going to have a conversation, I'm not going to talk about the decision of the Supreme Court. Plenty of people are already talking about that. What we're going to talk about today is um, what the stats are on comprehensive sex education and um, how to uh, prevent unplanned pregnancy. Now, as a sexologist, I'm sure you can imagine that I am a big proponent of sex positive, uh, age appropriate, comprehensive sex education. And um, I decided I was going to pull up what well, you might ask why. Well, it's not, I'm not just pulling numbers out of my head. There's a lot of science to back that up, not just from what people might consider uh, more progressive um, uh, agencies that advocate for comprehensive sex education, but also from conservative ones like the Brookings Institute. So I'm going to pull up a number of papers, both uh, from journals and from the Brookings Institute. And let's take a look at uh, what role um, comprehensive age appropriate sex education can have in uh, um, various forms of it, of educational environments, you know, from middle school and up. And what uh, institutions, more conservative institutions like the Brookings, Brookings Institute has to say about um, some of these numbers. All right, so let's start with the data around sex education, um, abstinence only education, and sort of, you know, a, a combination of the two. There is a paper that was published uh, in the, let's see, trying to find where the journal is. Uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to the journal. I'm not seeing it here, however. Uh, the title of the paper is Abstinence Only Education and Teen Pregnancy Rates, uh, Why We Need Comprehensive Sex Education in the U.S. The authors of this paper are Stanger Hall and um, Hall, and it was published October 14th, 2001. Now, what they looked at was the kind of sex education that goes on, and this directly relates to unplanned uh, pregnancy. Uh, let's see. So the results were, uh, they found that, um, th so they assigned three levels or um, yeah, well, four levels actually of abstinence education to the different, you know, where they looked at the different states to see where, what kind of sex education the states were providing. Uh, let's see. So, uh, it says among the 48 states in this analysis, uh, all U.S. states except North Dakota and Wyoming. 21 states stressed abstinence-only education, level three. Okay, so abstinence-only education is level three. Seven states emphasized abstinence education. That's a level two. 11 states covered abstinence in the context of comprehensive sex education. That's a level one. And nine states did not mention abstinence at all, so a level zero in their state laws or policies. Okay. So let's look at what the teen pregnancy rates were in those particular states 
with those different levels. So level zero, one, two, and three, zero being no mention of abstinence and three being abstinence only education. Okay. Well, how does that bear itself out in the pregnancy, uh, the teen pregnancy rates? All right. So in, in 2005, this is around the time that they looked at it, 11 states covered abstinence in the context. Uh, I'm sorry, let me find where I was at. Okay. Level zero states. So states that didn't mention abstinence. The teen pregnancy rate was about 58. Okay. Level one states, uh, which they did mention some abstinence, uh, the uh, pregnant teen pregnancy rate averaged 56. So it was a bit more comprehensive than just, you know, not mentioning abstinence at all. So it was a little lower. Level two states, it shot up to 61. Okay. And level three, three states that had abstinence only education only was 73. Okay. And this was, uh, yeah. So, uh, let's see. So we're seeing already numbers here where the teen pregnancy rates in this particular study that looked at the states and their, their sex education and the resulting teen pregnancy rates clearly showed that um, teen pregnancy was higher when there were there was more leaning towards abstinence only education than comprehensive sex education or no mention of abstinence at all. Okay. Well, if we're thinking about you know what's happening now in Texas, um, so this paper was actually uh, there are two papers from the Brookings Institute. Uh, one was published. Um, in 1970, January 1st of 1970. And uh, it was, the authors were Carpillo, Manlove, Sawhill, and Thomas. So this is 1970. So they looked at, uh, they did a an interesting simulation. Uh, they did the simulation perform the, this simulation was performed by family scape 2.0 a micro simulation of model or micro simulation model of family formation so what they did is they state here we simulate the effects of changes in contraceptive behavior among unmarried young women and men on rates of non-marital child childbearing abortion and child poverty these simulations are motivated by previous studies showing first that disadvantaged women are disproportionately likely to experience unplanned and non-marital pregnancies. And second, that many individuals at risk of unintended pregnancy do not use contraception or do not use it consistently or correctly. All right. So they basically took this micro simulation model and of family formation, and they um, went in one direction, which was non-contraceptive use. And in the other correction or in the other simulation, those non contraceptive users then became contraceptive users. Okay. What they found were, as they claimed here, uh, our results show that changes in either margin of behavior are likely to produce sizable effects. For example, we find that if 25% of non-contracepting unmarried women under the age of 30 were to begin to use contraception, abortion and non-marital birth rates among unmarried women in this age group would fall about 25% and about 13% respectively. We also find that this simulated increase in contraceptive use would reduce child the, the poverty rate amongst un, newborn children by about half of a percentage point. We obtained very similar results in another specification in which we assume that all currently contracepting women in our target population begin to use their chosen method consistently and correctly. <clears throat> they concluded that the consistency and correctness of contraceptive use among existing uh, contraceptors both represent promising and potentially cost-effective avenues for reducing the incidences of abortion, non-marital childbearing, and child poverty. So, all right, well, let's refer back to the previous study. It stated that when you, in, in, in 2005 at least, when this uh, paper was written in 2011, looking at 2005 numbers, when you increase the level of comprehensive sex education away from abstinence only education, you get a sizable decrease in unintended and unplanned teen pregnancy. The Brookings Institute found that if 
this kind if contraception was made more available, especially to disadvantaged and younger populations, that the pregnancy unintended and unplanned pregnancy rates would decrease. So seems to be a correlation there. All right. So in a paper that was also published by the Brookings Institute in 2019, uh, again, one of the authors was Sawhill and another one is Guyot. So what they found is that pregnancy rates are dropping somewhat in the United States as of 19, 2019. Uh, unintended pregnancies are an all-time low in the U.S., but still represent about 45% of all pregnancies. All right. And they're using unintended and unplanned interchangeably in the paper. Uh, about 40% of unplanned pregnancies end in abortion, while the other 60% result in birth. The result is about one-third of all births are unplanned. Unintended pregnancies and births are most common among young unmarried women, especially teens and the most disadvantaged. Okay. Um, so now they're, they kind of looked at the declines over the course of time and why they might've declined. Um, and they found that mostly the reasons are somewhat obscure, but some potential reasons stand out. The first has to do with changes in social norms around women's roles. Most women are respected to work to get some post-secondary education to support their families, which make unplanned childbearing more costly and benefits of delay much greater. The second reason is greater access and increased use of the most effective forms of contraception, such as LARC, which is the abbreviation for long-acting reversible con contraceptives. Okay. Um, again, they found that low-income women tend to have the least access to contraception through employer-sponsored health insurance, and many rely on publicly su subsidized family planning services. Two of the key federal programs that do uh, supply this are Title X Family Planning Grants and Medicaid. The Affordable Care Act also increased access to contraception. Okay. Efforts to curtail those services are now underway, fueled mainly by religious and moral beliefs. Now, mind you, this is something I'm reading from the Brookings Institute. Okay. And this is what they found. Um, let's see. Um, some init state initiatives, often in collaboration with philanthropic funding, have played a positive role in preventing unplanned pregnancies by expanding access to family planning services. Studies of programs in Missouri, Colorado, Iowa, Delaware, and Utah suggest such efforts have had some success. Um, they have included or involved some combination of training pro providers, making the most effective forms of contraception more available and affordable, screening for pregnancy intentions in health visits, and educating potential users via internet, TV, social marketing campaigns. These state initiatives have not only led to declines in unplanned pregnancies, but also contributed to declining abortion rates and lower government costs for health care and social assistance. Again, going back to that uh, study in the 70s um, and the study in 2011, you make um, affordable contraception available, abortion rates drop, especially amongst younger and disadvantaged people. All right. Um, there are controversies, obviously. Um, some conservatives are concerned about casual sex outside of marriage, and none of them really address it here, but there is plenty of research out there to suggest that, um, well, actually, the abstinence-only education. Sex occurs um, amongst uh, young people regardless of whether or not they get comprehensive sex education or abstinence-only education. It's just a matter of how they are able to manage their own sexual health, depending on the educational um, access that they had. Again, coming back to that 2011 study showing what it showed, which I stated earlier. While the controversies persist, most people agree that empowering women to have only the children they want has positive benefits for everyone in the form of better pregnancy outcomes. So in other words, more pregnancies are able to be carried to term. The health of the mother is improved. Um, improved child well-being, more opportunities for women and their partners, reductions in cost to government, and lower abortion rates. So in light of the, um, the law that was just passed uh, in um, Texas, uh, or went into effect, I should say, that the Supreme Court refused to uh, provide injunctive relief for. I think the argument, uh, and again, you can have a conversation all day long about um, it, in what way the, the Supreme Court should have enforced 
50 years of precedent. Um, I think more than ever, uh, there is a solid argument, especially with the wealth of data to support it, that states here in the United, in the, in the U.S. Uh, will improve the lives of children and families by um, providing age-appropriate comprehensive sex education to its population. That's all I've got for today. So I wish you a very wonderful Labor Day weekend. I hope that you get to get out and um, enjoy nature um, and uh, I will see you all next week.